Hello and welcome to Heartlight Vedic Astrology. Uh, today I was going to talk about Coco Chanel in Vedic Astrology or Jyotish um, and seeking her true birth chart. Um, in my last uh, video, uh, Planetary Transits for August, I started to get into her chart and uh, uh, there was a lot of confusion. It didn't seem very straightforward, so I was questioning her birth data, even though it's uh, presence uh, all over the internet and it says things like uh, birth chart in hand that sort of thing but we'll, we'll get into all that and, and her actual birth chart certificate or her birth certificate and issues there and then get into uh, potentially her birth chart so that we figure out who Coco Chanel actually was all right so Coco Chanel's birth chart part two <laughs> part two um, so just some background from my last video. I'm not going to get into the whole thing because it was uh, fairly extensive. Again, it's at the very end of my last video if you want to check all that out. But uh, for some reason, even though I felt like my discussion there was mostly complete, I still couldn't let it go. <laughs> um, it still felt like a cliffhanger to me, I guess. Or maybe it wouldn't let me go. Um, and also Mercury's retrograde coming up. So <laughs> review, reassess, you know, all that energy is in the air currently. So who knows? But um, anyway, my video, if you do want to check out that first part of the discussion is the Vedic Astrology, Jochish Planetary Transits or Gochara for August 2023. And if you want to start at the Coco Chanel part, that starts at one hour, 55 minutes, 57 seconds. So Coco Chanel, or her Gabrielle is her birth name, um, her official birth date is 19th of August, 1883, uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Samoa, France. And that's all over the internet, and people have, you know, analyzed her birth chart um, using that information. When I use this birth data, I, it produced a Sagittarius or Danu in uh, Sanskrit, Lugna, rising sign, ascendant, first house, those are all different names for the first thing. And I went through that as if it was the true chart, and I did a full analysis. So that was like attempt number one <laughs> at, at trying to, uh, you know, kind of understand Coco Chanel through Vedic astrology. It, it wasn't very satisfying, as I went into in, in the previous video. And I also discussed in that video, I tried to look at the moon rising chart or the Chandra Lugna and the sun rising chart of the Surya Lugna. Um, and that didn't seem to get me closer so that was sort of attempts number two and three. And then what I did was I did a Prashna technique, which is essentially you ask a question and cast a chart at the time of asking the question. And that can bring some insights into the issue at hand. And you can also use consider that a sort of a Samaya chart or update chart for Coco Chanel. So I use that. And that gave me a Scorpio or Rishika uh, rising chart. Um, with Moon, Saturn, and Mars in the Lugna, or in the rising um, sign. So that was attempt number four. And that seemed to give me the closest, like that that felt right. It, it seemed to work out with her, the history of her life. But, you know, again, I, I, yeah, I ended the discussion there. I thought I did, but then it was still swirling around in my mind. So I kept going and went back and decided to look further so what i did was um i went looking for official birth chart and i found a copy on this site website that i listed here and let's take a look at her birth certificate and see why part why there is some discrepancy so coco gabrielle chanel her birth certificate okay so here's a copy and i just uh made a clip of her actual birth data so obviously it's in French, um, and the first line or so here is basically her birth data. It says uh, l'an 1883, so 1883, that's the year, le 20 août, that's the 20th of August, uh, à 4 heures du soir, so 4 o'clock in the evening. But you can see it was written, 4 heures uh, was written, that's 4 o'clock, but there's no minutes listed. So it doesn't give an exact birth time. Um, so whatever was in her birth certificate was an approximation only. The other thing is her parents were not there um, when the birth certificate was written. Um, I guess her mother was too ill and her father, I don't know, maybe he was traveling. He was a traveling salesman. 
Um, and so then the question is like, how do they even come up with four o'clock in the afternoon? So afternoon probably is correct, uh, you know, um, but you know, did they round up? So maybe every hour, <laughs> you, know, you know, all the babies born between three and four o'clock got the four o'clock designation, maybe. Maybe they rounded to the nearest hour. So did they do 3.30 to 4.30? You know, how did they go about deciding it was four o'clock? So again, it's fairly vague in her birth chart or birth certificate. The other thing is there was a typo there, at least one major typo. Uh, they listed her um, last name as Chesnell. So there's an S in there. Um, and then the other thing is that um, uh, even though her birthday is, is known as the 19th of August, you see in this birth certificate, it says 20th of August. So... How does that come about? And the author on this website didn't know. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why. You know, uh, so again, there's a lot of discrepancy with the birth certificate. The other thing is she tended to fabricate a lot of um, misinformation about the beginning of her life uh, to cover up the fact that she was born into poverty, especially because she was, you know, rubbing elbows with higher echelon, you know, wealthy folks. Um, um, you know, when she, she, her business and enterprise took off. So she did a lot of covering up um, of, of facts and made up stories and things like that. So um, who knows, maybe even this was fabricated. There were some also, also some uh, documents that showed up, I think posthumously for her that indicated she had an association and a collaboration with the Nazi regime that had invaded Paris during the really kind of height of her uh, business. So who knows? <laughs> you know? So what's kind of funny is that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's funny to me that even though, you know, a lot of people don't believe in astrology, um, actually, if, if you do it well and do it right, it can actually give you insights, probably deeper insights into the truth of things. Um, rather than what people say and do, because people have, you know, various motives for what they say and do. So anyway, so this is part of why there's a discrepancy with her chart and why I think the information I used threw me off. Um, so anyway, let's get into what I did with it now. So this is attempt number five, and five is actually a significant number for Coco Chanel. It was her lucky number. She presented her uh, fashion collection on the fifth day of the fifth month of her year, and she chose uh, Chanel number five, the perfume. She was presented with different options, one through five, and then I think 20 through 24 or something like that, 10 different options. And without even opening it, she chose number five. And that's like <laughs> one of the most best-selling products for the whole brand of Chanel. And today is still, I believe, the most widely selling perfume in the world. So we'll get into a bit, a bit of that, uh, you know, her, her lucky number. But apparently the lucky number five was a lucky number for me. It took me five attempts to get it. Um, I think what is her um, true chart or at least a closer uh, chart than what I've seen so far. So the information I used uh, to pr pr produce this chart was 19th of August, 1883, 15.26 p.m. So why did I use 19th of August even though 20th of August was on her birth certificate? When I did that Prashna Samaya update chart, um, what was in the Lugna was, I mentioned, was Moon, uh, Saturn, and Mars. And so it seemed to me, and specifically it was a Saturn on the moon, and Saturn was in the nakshatra of Shatapisha. Um, so that seemed really important. Um, that seemed like important information to keep as I was sorting through different variations of what her chart could be. So to me, the moon was important, which symbolizes imagination and her mind, because that was clearly very important with her success in life. Saturn was very important because that was really the Dasha or planetary period when she really started rising in life. Um, and actually, uh, that was also the critical time when she left. She started basically her Saturn Dasha once she left the convent, um, which I'll get into a little bit of her early life and how that was critical. That information from early in what life was critical for um, coming up with this chart. Um, 
So if you if you take the twentieth of August, then the moon moves positions, and um, is Saturn is no longer on the moon. So that seemed it actually seemed important that the nineteenth of August was kept. Um, Fifteen twenty six. So why did I use that specific time? One, I wanted something obviously something close to four o'clock. Although who knows, maybe four o'clock wasn't correct, but you know, still going with that. Um, and um, for uh, her to have a Sagittarius rising uh, chart, the time frame for that was fifteen twenty six to seventeen twenty six, and that was the first information I used. So it was kind of close to four o'clock, and then. What is it? Uh, an hour and a half after. So there's about half an hour um, before four o'clock when she still could have been Sagittarius rising. If she was a Scorpio, the time range for that, it would have had to be in, been between 12.53 p.m., 15.26 p.m. So 15.26 is, is kind of the cusp time between Scorpio and uh, Sagittarius. Um and so, um, yeah, the other thing is that I started not only looking at, um, in Sagittarius, if this was in the first uh, nakshatra of Sagittarius, it would have been Mula, which I discussed in the previous video, which is uh, symbolized by um, a group of roots uh, that are tied together, and there's this uh, energy of destruction, like Kali, the goddess of destruction, is a deity related to that. In the last part of Scorpio, the nakshatra associated with that is Jesta, and Jesta, as I'll get into, is also a potential fit for her and, and how she went about her life. So if we narrow the Scorpio time, which was 1253 to 1526, and we narrow that down to 1421 to 1526, that gives us a shorter time frame. And again, I think that Scorpio Jesta works well for her. As I go through the chart, you'll see there really isn't anything that can be like, mm, I don't know, that works, but that works here, but it doesn't work here. I didn't have that with this chart. It's like everything flowed um when i went through so um again my methods for coming up with this you know i'm sure people have questions and they can have their own theories or whatever but again when i set things up like like this without really maneuvering it too hard this seemed to shake out and work pretty well so i uh, went with it um and then the other the other issue though is that if I use five twenty six or so, it's literally the minute when when the, sh the signs were changing. And the last degree of Scorpio, the time range for not just the last nakshatra of Scorpio, which is the nakshatra covers about a third um, of a constellation. The last degree is only like one thirtieth of the constellation. So the time for the last. Uh, um, minute of the constellation the time range there was 1521 to 1526 so it was about a five minute period the thing though is that when you have a chart that um has a as the lugna is associated with the last degree of a of a constellation what that does is because it's on the cusp it um actually travels through the amshas or the um it, it affects the amshas uh the subzodiacs because the amshas are basically derived by slicing and dicing the constellations into different sized parts like the d3 you basically um, slice up the constellation each constellation to three parts and then rederive a chart from that and then if you do like the D30, you basically take a constellation and you slice it up into 30 parts and then you do a new chart from that. So th those are how the amshas are derived. Anyway, if you think if you have, um, and there's 60 amshas, um, not all of which are used, I think, um, but you know, maybe, maybe two thirds of them, maybe 20 out of 30 are, are used, um, I think frequently. Um, anyway, uh, if, you have a lugna in the last degree of the chart. That means that 14 of the amshas, so 
quite a few, if not a majority of the options that are used, flip. And so when I use the 1526 time, 14 of her amshas, um, and again, amshas are what we would typically use if we were rectifying or trying to correct a uh, chart. 14 of them would flip. Like, I think the cutoff was 1526, 15, 15, 15th hour, 26 minutes, and, and 11 seconds. So it's like, which part of 1526 are you using? And that would flip a bunch of these amshas. But the thing is, if I use 526, then the amshas could line up in a way that worked with her life. So to really go through all all that and try to correct all those amshas, like 14 of them, I mean, that's like, you know, <laughs> I don't know, like weeks of work. Um, so anyway, maybe somebody, you know, is, is has a motivation to do that. Um, I wasn't quite there, even though I've spent a lot of time on her chart. Um, the other thing is that, so that's, that's the time frames and how I was trying to narrow it down and how I got to this number. Although I admit this number may not be correct, but again, when I went through the analysis of the chart, a lot of things ticked off pretty well. So I think it's pretty close, if not exact. Um, so her beginning to Shah, she was born into Rahu moon. So that was the planetary period she was born in. But she entered Jupiter to Shah very quickly after that. And she ran Jupiter from, from a year and a half to 17 and a half. It was essentially her childhood. And up until the time um, she was in the convent in her teen years, she got dropped off in the convent by her father at about age 11, 12. And she was there um, until she was 18. She wasn't, when she turned 18, she wasn't allowed to be in the convent anymore. So the Jupiter period for her was essential. Um, so let's start going through. Um, we will start at the top of the chart and the rising sign first house, Lugna, you know, again, all different names are the same thing. So using this birth data, um, she was a Scorpio or Vershika Lugna, Vershika is Sanskrit for um, Scorpio. And again, it's in the last degree, so it was Sunday. And just uh, Sunday means uh, a planet or a Lugna that's in the first or last degree of any constellation. And that creates instability because you're switching energies. So Scorpio is a water sign, and uh, the next constellation is that shares a fire sign. So we're switching from water to fire, and that's a huge transition in and of itself. So it creates instability as you're transitioning from those, you know, from one element to the next. Um, and Scorpio is ruled by Mars. So for her, uh, Mars is important, and that corresponds with the Prussian Semiotic chart I came up with. Uh, in the previous video. Mars for her in this chart went to the eighth house, so that would make her an eighth house person to some degree. And it's in Mrigashirsha. Mrigashirsha is a nakshatra that's symbolized by the head of a deer. And Mrigashirsha is all about, it's, it's kind of like the deer running through the woods. Um, so there's some sensitivity there. There's also like drive and a journey and um, you know, like often in mythology and different cultures, the deer is all about like finding one's way through the dark forest, you know, twists and turns and sort of the stuff of legends and fairy tales, that sort of thing, finding one's way. You know. Mars is a planet that's uh, fiery. It symbolizes things like innovation, pioneering spirit, <clears throat> fighting spirit, aggression, um, unconventionality, rebelliousness. And so all those, because Mars is a ruling planet of Scorpio, Scorpio carries all of those qualities as well. Now the eighth house uh, represents things like skex, scandals, hiding, other people's money, uh, thoughts. So, and all these things were part of her life. Um, and since Mars was in uh, Mergashirsha, you know, again, Mars is this fiery, aggressive energy in a uh, nakshatra that's actually fairly benign you know a deer is a fairly gentle creature but what i got from that was she was actually the hunter <laughs> more than the hunted yeah so and i think that was true uh i think she sought out opportunity and jumped on it when she had a chance um mars also symbolizes things like uh libido and so that planet in the eighth house of sex and stuff you know she was a lusty person and other things like courageous. Um, the other thing, Mergashirsha nakshatras are related to things like sales and marketing. 
And I think that was her true, like, superpower in life. I mean, she was she was a good designer and stuff, but she knew how to get it out there and get it to, into the right hands and the right people in front of the right people. Um, so I think um, that worked. Uh, that was really her true superpower. Um, the other thing is Mars can represent uh, things like um, thievery. And the eighth house also is a house that represents, represents thievery. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, the eighth house is going to bring, uh, since Mars is the lord of the first house as well as the sixth house, it's going to bring this energy of the self here into the eighth house. Um, and uh, so themes of the self into, the, into this area. Um, and the other thing is the sixth house represents things like enemies. So, um, you know, it's going to bring things like body personality into the marketing. And, and she herself was, was part of her sales promotion. Um, she was walking around in her designs and um, shoot. Uh, you know, she was kind of the first person, you know, the influencer, so to speak, if we're talking in modern day terms, to photograph herself and wear her designs. You know, like she was a walking, talking kiosk or something. And, um and you know she did all that um she i think she thought that up and, and used it well or if she didn't think it up she used it well um and then again the sixth house energy coming into the eighth house um when i saw k2 there you know uh, k2 represents things that are foreign explosive um hidden uh and so those were her enemies um of various kinds and, um, you know, the lord of that house is uh, Mars. So bringing, she, when I saw this combination, the first phrase that came to mind was sleeping with the enemy, um, which is uh, very possible given her association as a Nazi collaborator and also um, having, obvious, you know, I think uh, fairly public affairs with high level Nazi officials, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing is the eighth house is related to esoterica, um, and clearly she had some some thoughts about numerology. If uh, five was her lucky number, the other thing is that, uh, from what I understand, she tended to keep objects in her home that were sort of um, like protective objects. And um, well, this also gets at Jesta. Jesta, the symbol of Jesta, Nakshatra, is a talisman, so a protective amulet. Uh, so, you know, uh, it seems like that's all there. Um, uh, the other thing that's important about Mars is Mars is her yogi graha. So the yogi graha in a chart is a, a planet that indicates money. So whatever this thing with this affair situation, hidden marketing situation, aggression, innovation with marketing, Mars directly uh, aspects her second house of, of uh, savings of wealth. Um, uh, and also her Lugna is ruled by Mars. So those are two indications that she you know, saw some, some wealth in her life, and she saw plenty. Um, the other thing that's interesting about Mars is Mars, as a planet, is in a star ruled by Mars. So you kind of double up on this uh, Martian yogi graha um, The other thing is that Mars also aspects the 11th house of income. So this Mars, even though there's some deviousness, it seems, um, brought her a lot of money. Um, the other thing is that <clears throat> Jupiter is really important here. I'll get into Jupiter uh, more later. Uh, but because she ran the Jupiter to Shah and she had a very strong Jupiter, uh, and the placement of Jupiter, I think, was essential for her and her success. I'll get into more of that. Uh, let's just finish up here with the Lugna. So the first task again, Scorpio, fixed water. So she was somebody who is fairly rigid, uh, fixed uh, constellations, people with fixed constellation uh, charts. They're very uh, solid, uh, but they can uh, become rigid um, and difficult. They may have difficulty uh, changing their ways. Um, Scorpio is also intense, sexual, secretive, rebellious, innovative, transformative, aggressive. And she, I think, demonstrated all those qualities. 
uh, the Jaista Nakshatra. Uh, it can bring energy such as being two-faced, secretive, hypocritical, but also founder, famous, and also pork barreling. So, you know, another um, pork barreling, not just sort of misuse of public funds, but other, that's an indication that sort of, uh, how do we say, like other misuses of authority and influence and, and funds uh, uh, were potentially at play here, especially because uh, Mars is a malevolent planet. So the more negative aspects of, of these placements is going to come forward. And then the other thing is Jaysta is ruled by Mercury. So now we're bringing more Mercury energy into this. And I think Mercury is also uh, is essential for her uh, success as a, as a business person. So her Lugna was also aspected by Saturn and Rogini. Saturn is a planet representing structure. Um, tradition, uh, servitude, um, can represent things like poverty, um, and it's in Rohini. Um, uh, Rohini is a nakshatra that's, uh, Rohini was the wife of Jupiter, or Jupiter had many wives, and uh, Jupiter, Rohini was the most attractive of the 27 wives, and the 27 wives represented the 27 nakshatras and lunar mansions. So there were times when she was quite poor, um, and this Lugna uh, was also aspected by an exalted Jupiter. Jupiter is exalted in the ninth house. Um, the ninth house represents things like father, government, and also spirituality and satsang, so spiritual community. And the fact that she ran Jupiter during her early years, and she ended up in a convent, that lines up perfectly with this. Um, and then there was also this Kambas Venus in Ishlesha. Um, so that's going to bring this, even though Venus was not directly aspecting her Lugna, because it was conjoined with her Jupiter, there was still this trail of the Kambas Venus in Ishlesha in her Lugna. Venus is the plant that represents sensuality, love, romance, sex, the finer things of life. It was Kambas, so... These are things you wouldn't necessarily see on in the external world, but you would uh, feel more deeply potentially. And Ashlesha is a nakshatra that's symbolized by a snake. So that's going to bring forward the more kind of sexual and kind of seductive hypnotic aspects of Venus and sensuality through this whole chart. Um, so when you get this combination of Saturn and Rokini with an exalted Jupiter and Punarvasu, oh, Punarvasu I didn't talk about. Punarvasu is symbolized by a quiver of arrows, so there's a home base and the arrows go out and come back, go out and come back. And her father was a traveling salesman, and he happened to sell um, women's undergarments. So uh, Venus and Jupiter also both represent travel, so her father traveled a lot, yes. Um, and Venus being combust again, selling women's undergarments were hidden in a way, hidden sensuality, hidden sexuality, that sort of thing. So this lines up with who he was. And Jupiter and in, in, um, being an exalted Jupiter, for him, he had a Hamsa Yoga. That's a Raj Yoga. Um, and Hamsa Yoga is when Jupiter is exalted or swa in its own sign in either Kendra, one of the central. Um, central uh, Baba's houses here, or five and nine. So she, that Jupiter period for her was essential, um, even though the story was told that her father just dropped her off at the convent. Um, the thing is, his, his wife died. She was 11. She was the second oldest kid. There were six kids. I think one of them died in about six months. So basically, this gentleman who was a traveling salesman, his wife dies, and he has five kids under the age of 12. Um, I think it was three girls and two boys that were left, um, or two girls and three boys. Anyway, they were split about even, uh, you know, uh, female and male. So the girl, I think it was three girls, because I remember three girls getting dropped up at the convent, if I remember correctly. Anyway. The girls he took to a convent and dropped them off there where they were taken care of by nuns. The boys he sent to go work on farms. And so the thing is, even though 
in her mind, uh, she was separated from her family and her, and her father never showed up, I think, again. Um, this was a kind man and a wise man. And, um, you know, what were his other choices um, as a traveling salesman and five kids under 12? Like, how is he going to take care of them? Like, not only like monetarily, but functionally. So I think he did what he could. He put the boys to work so that they would develop some skills and be able to take care of themselves. The women, the girls, I mean, what choices did they have? Um, and these kids, I don't think any of the kids got any education. So what choices did they have? Uh, they're not going to, you know, they're going to live in poverty if, if they're like the mother washing clothes. That's what she did. Um, so he could have just taken off and left them behind and, you know, didn't give them any direction. But at least he thought to bring them to a convent. So he thought about it. He was thoughtful about it and, and kind about it. Um, what, what else was he supposed to do? Take them all on the road? How was he supposed to take care of five kids on the road? Uh, that, you know, that's chaotic in and of itself just for him, probably. Um, and also for women. I mean, he could have pimped them out. I mean, some fathers do that, right? As they pimp out, they pimp out their or female, especially their female children, sometimes their male children too. So he probably thought this was the best way to go. Um, and again, for her, as we go through her chart, I think it was a saving grace for her in her life. Um, because what she did in the convent, you know, chanting the Hail Marys and singing the hymns and studying the Bible and this very um, disciplined, austere, but also pristine life, created a lot of good karma for her. And again, with Vedic astrology, you know, the whole name of the game here is like, essentially what we're doing is assessing people's karma. Where are the pockets of good karma? And where are the pockets of negative karma? Because when somebody asks me, you know, am I going to have a relationship? Or am I going to have a house? Or am I going to have a car? What they're essentially asking is, do I have the karma for this to manifest this? And that's what I'm looking for in a chart. So, um, so this Jupiter um, in the ninth house, and the ninth house is also what we call a punyastana, a house of good karma. This Jupiter aspected into her first house of self. And again, you know, maybe it was austere, maybe it wasn't a lot of fun because again, this Kambas Venus, uh, a con convent's life is like, you know, you know, the women who have the, the, the habits on, I mean, they hide their femininity, they hide, you know, they hide their sexuality, their sensuality, it's all like undercover. And that's essentially what convent life was. So you can see this, like how this Kambas Venus was playing in various ways, like the father sold undergarments, so sensuality you couldn't see. The, the nuns at the convent, you know, they hid their sensuality. And even, uh, you know, Coco Chanel's whole thing with her, her fashion was, you know, discreet sensuality, not just like blaring it in your face. Um, so you, you see how this Kambas Venus played out. Um, even though it was hidden, there was a seductive quality for all of us, yeah. Um, so the, the Jupiter aspected into her first house. So even though it may not have been fun for a kid, it was pristine. At least she was clean. At least she was fed. At least she had some, you know, religious education, if not like a secular education. She also learned how to sew here. And that was a critical skill for her, uh, you know, in her business. Um, so the thing that... <laughs> Uh, oh, and let me finish with Jupiter here. Jupiter was also aspecting into her fifth house, into its own sign in the fifth house. The fifth house represents things like creativity, and it represents things like um, uh, counseling. It also represents things like what we call mantra, yantra, tantra, so chanting. She was chanting all these years, and, and by doing that, the fifth house is also another punyastana, another house of good karma. Um, so all this chanting and all those things that she was doing in her, in her teen years, you know, staying away from negative influences, who knows what was out there, drugs and sex and what, what was she supposed to do? She was on her own on the streets, you know, those were probably her choices. Like she was actually building good karma. And the other thing is that her second house, um, is Sagittarius that's ruled by Jupiter. And, you know, again, I'll get into more of her story later, but that was also, I think, critical. So, again, all this good karma she was generating in the convent, I think, was part of what um, popped up this huge amount of wealth and legacy that, that she, she uh, developed over the years, yeah. 
So getting back to the notes here, I, I diverge, but you know, I go with the energy where, where it leads me. Um, but so that, again, the Saturn, Rohini, Exalted Jupiter combination and the Lugna, you know, we're talking beautiful, the most beautiful structures, servant class, plain clothes, sewing, not obviously feminine, unseen, attraction, seduction, hypnotizing. So I basically talked about that. Okay, so what other ways, as I was going through the chart, what other ways was I was I looking at for the whole, the, the chart as a whole didn't seem to work for her and her life and the history of her life. So one major event that happened in her life was on December 22nd, 1919. Her um, longtime um, uh, relationship uh, with Arthur Boy Capel, he died in a car accident. So, and she was considered, I believe, the major love of her life, at least up to that time, and maybe her the whole of her life. So on that day, Saturn was in Leo in this chart. So if you imagine Saturn in Leo, the 10th house here, and because Saturn aspects 10 houses away, um, it's going to aspect into her seventh house and recreate her natal Saturn. The seventh house is also um, a house that represents uh, relationships, especially spouse-like relationships and independent business. So Saturn represents things like death, chronic illness. Um, so the fact that Saturn was aspecting the seventh house could indicate a loss or death of a partner, especially because she was running the Desha of Saturn. So Saturn was very active in her life. Um, and then the other thing is K2 was in the seventh house at that time. K2, again, represents things like sudden, hidden, unexpected, explosive accidents. Yes. Um, and it was in the first degree of the constellation. So it was just about to move because uh, uh, K2 uh, moves, always moves in a retrograde fashion, move, was going to move, was about to move on the verge of moving from Taurus into Aries. So you have these two major malevolent planets on the seventh house, um, squeezing this house. And um, again, uh, what else was also going? Oh yeah, and my notes here, Venus. So the planet that represents spouse and relationships was in the 12th house of loss. So the, on the day of his death, the planetary transits that are going on correspond with what happened with him and the way he passed. And again, this happened during her Saturn-Jupiter period. Jupiter at that time was in a shlesha. Um, uh, so Jupiter, uh, there was a shakeup with Jupiter because again, a shlesha has this snake-like energy, like snakes, you know, move around, uh, slither around, but then when they're threatened, it's like, you know, it's like a, they pop up and, uh, you know, bite or sting, you know, sting or hiss or whatever. So, um, but she was at the very end of the Saturn to so he's squeezing out the last bit of the Saturn karma in this period. And then in February of 1920, so just, uh, what is it, less than two months later, and I believe it's the beginning of, within a month or so, she was in her Mercury, Mercury period. So it was a huge, you know, there are all these forces, you know, it was a perfect storm, unfortunately, for the passing of um, Arthur Capel. Um, and it, this actually also works with Saturn being in, again, if you take the 50, if we take this 1526 time as an exact birth time, if you look at her D9, which is the subzodiac or Amsha related to spouse or partner, at 1526, Saturn has the potential of being in the D3. The D3, that house in the Amsha is considered a house that uh, can reflect change and uh, endings. It's considered a negative house. Uh, so again, it looks like things line up there. At least there's a potential to line up there. Um, Saturn was also, because it was, um, you know, for her, Saturn, in her natal chart, Saturn is on the one seven axis. Uh, that can indicate for somebody that they're less likely to get married. Not always, but it's a possibility. And her Venus, which is, um, getting back to Kamba's Venus again, is the Lord of her seventh house. So 
that it can indicate not seeing a partner often or um, especially being in Venus, a sudden loss of partner. So again, that all corresponds. So getting back to house by house uh, analysis here. So now if we go to the second house, the second order is exalted Jupiter. I mentioned that it's aspected by Mars. I mentioned that Mars can also represent things like the nose. So if you, Mars is her yogi graha, so money, and Mars is in the nose, and Mars is in Rigashirsha nakshatra, so uh, marketing and sales. She has a nose for marketing and sales, also like literally perfume. Uh, and that was her, and again, she she only chose this perfume based on the number of the 10 samples she was presented with. So that's pretty wild. Um, the second house also represents early education. So again, the early education would correspond, since she didn't have a formal education, things she learned in her life and on the street, um, you know, survival, but also the, the religious training, uh, and her both of her parents were involved with clothing. Her mother was a laundress, and her father sold clothes on the, on the road. Um, so she was actually in 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 the field, uh, you know, through her family, both sides. Um, and you know, there's a street smart aspect. Uh, you know, Mars is very wily and uh, cunning, can be. So there's all that. Okay, so also related to this, so in 1921, that's when Shilnon number no. 5, the perfume, was created. And in 1922, it was first produced. So this is, so again, this corresponds with this switch from the Saturn to Shah to the Mercury to Shah. So Saturn is, again, obstacles, delays, chronic health, poverty. And Mercury is business, accounting, sales, marketing. Um, intelligence. So uh, the switch in planets, uh, the planetary period is 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 when this whole Mercury thing, uh, the Chanel number no. five thing came out. But she didn't even really know what she was dealing with. Actually, she created the Chanel number no. five as a gift for her top clients. But I think she only produced about a hundred bottles to give them out as Christmas presents that year. And then when she saw everybody raving about it, she decided to mass produce it and mass market it. So it became a whole thing, but it wasn't initially meant to be a whole thing, I don't think. So, um, and to this day, uh, she, um, uh, that perfume number five, Chanel number five is one of the top five products for the whole brand. It's the top selling perfume worldwide. So that's pretty amazing. So then if we move on to the third house here, that's a house of uh, communications. It's Capricorn, aspected by Mars exalt and the exalted Jupiter and the Combus Venus, so that, that whole thing. But again, Capricorn is grounded. It's a house of communication, so there's going to be practical, wise, edgy, not sugar, but speech or communication that's not sugar-coated. And I think this um, is a house that represents these Chanel, you know, quote-unquote Chanelism she came up with, where... She would just drop these like pithy and edgy one-liners that were so memorable. They just hit home because they really, there was some wisdom in there as well. And uh, that's also part of why she became famous. So um, that seems to correspond. So let's move on to the next slide, which is essentially the same chart, but I'm just going through more of the houses. So let's keep going here. Okay, so this slide, uh, the left side of the slide is the same as the previous one. So all the chart and arrows, uh, uh, information below it is the same. On the right side here are the notes, because I'm going to go through the other houses and how they line up with uh, Coco Chanel's life. So the fourth house, we have Moon and Shatabisha. The Moon represents the mother, and the house of uh, the fourth house represents mother. So this creates a Karko Bhavanasha, which can indicate issues with the mother. Shatabisha is a, a nakshatra uh, that translates as 100 healers. So uh, there can be some health issues here. It's also aspected by Saturn. So the planet that represents obstacles, delays, chronic health, um, and uh, that sort of thing. So, um, and also things like beautiful structures. So an Aquarius, so it uh, looks like mother had quite a bit of imagination. Um, 
but there were issues. She was a servant, which again, Saturn's going to bring that uh, energy to her life. Health issues. Um, the fourth house also represents education. And uh, with Saturn being things like obstacles and delays, that can mean education is stalled. And as far as I know, uh, Coco Chanel never received a formal education. So all of her training was just experience of life, school of life, I guess. Um, the other thing is that when Coco Chanel uh, turned about 18, she entered her Saturn period. <clears throat> when you have Saturn on the moon like this, it can indicate things like anxiety, depression. And that's when she had to fend for herself. She was no longer uh, protected by her family or the convent. And she had to make it on her own. <clears throat> so it can also indicate things like displacement from home, which was true for her. And um, a poor or at least a conservative small home. Nothing lavish at all, which uh, I think she grew up in a, a shanty or something like that. Um, but again, there's this uh, aspect of being somebody who had the ability to imagine beautiful structures and engineering. And even though her mother was a laundress, a washerwoman, she probably didn't have the opportunity um, to you know, be a couturier like her daughter. But um, I think the imagination was uh, she got from her mother and then the sales and marketing she got from her father because, again, the Saturn is aspecting both the fourth house of mother as well as the ninth house of father. So then we, we move on to the fifth house. I mentioned already a bit Pisces aspected this uh, is aspected here by an exalted Jupiter. That's this especially was important during her uh, Jupiter to Shah during her childhood and teenage years. And this again is when she was chanting and praying. And this is a Punyastana, a house of good karma. It also is going to make her very intuitive uh, because Jupiter represents in intuition and being in its own house in the fifth position, fifth house here. She's going to be quite intuitive. And that was probably what um, part of her, her gift as well and her uh, success. Uh, the sixth house here, we have K2 and Barani. Hidden unexpected explosive enemies, accidents, and also drug use and addictions. Um, she apparently was a heroin addict and injected heroin most of her life until her death. So uh, I mentioned the other chart, like the first chart um, version of her chart that I try uh, that I analyzed. Uh, I didn't see drug use, and in this chart I clearly do. The seventh house here, Saturn and Rohini. I mentioned that a bit. You know. Uh, lack of partner, lack of marriage, uh, death of partner, divorce. Uh, Saturn in the in the seventh house can be difficult. Not always. Um, it can indicate things like um, a formal marriage, uh, like a uh, arranged marriage, or uh, a marriage that um, endures. But again, it depends on. You have to look at the other. Uh, condition of Saturn and the Lord of the house. And because the Lord of the house is combusting for her, that's pushing things more towards the idea of her not getting married, which I don't think she ever would. Um, but this is also the seventh house is also the house of independent business. So um, her independent business has, there's nothing else aspecting the seventh house. So you still have the Saturn and Rohini beautiful structures and the Lord of the Seventh House, this hidden seductive Venus. Um, so that makes sense there. Um, yeah, so if you combine the utilitarian structures, especially with their pared down minimalist approach to fashion, with this hidden sensuality femininity, it wasn't this sort of overt, you know, super sexy in your face type stuff that she was producing. The Eighth House we talked about quite a bit. Uh, the Ninth House we talked about quite a bit uh, again. This Jupiter, I think this Jupiter father uh, was her saving grace and protection, as I mentioned. He was a traveling salesman, sold women's undergarments. I think I covered most of this already. Um, oh, the part I didn't talk about was the ninth house can also represent government. So um, how would this potentially represent the Nazi regime? Well, Jupiter... Um, um, you know, traveling back and forth with this Punarvasi nakshatra energy at a home base and was traveling. So essentially, the Nazi regime was um, had a base in Paris, but was traveling back and forth because the real base was Berlin. The other thing is that uh, Venus combust here could 
as I, I think I mentioned, but I will mention again, in liaisons, because, um, especially sexual liaisons, because uh, Venus is the house, is the lord of the seventh house of relationships and intense business. It's also the house of the, uh, it's also the lord of the twelfth house of foreign um, lands and enterprise, as well as things that are hidden, lost. Um, and the, the twelfth house also represents sex, because there's a, not only like, um, when people um, have sex, they lose fluids and they sort of lose consciousness in a way um, because they're so in their feeling body and their physical body and that sort of thing. They sort of lose consciousness with other things around them potentially. So um, I think this is where that, you know, liaisons with the Nazi regime comes in. And then the thing is this aspect with the Saturn, once she you know, this, this beautiful Jupiter there giving her also a Hamsa yoga, <clears throat> you know, a yoga, a Raj yoga, royalty yoga, um, because of the choices she made during her Saturn period, um, that she, you know, she could have, instead of, you know, she could have become a nun. It seems like that was a possibility for her, but she chose to go out, um, in the secular world and the difficult choices she had to make to survive um, I think we're not as above board, not as pristine as her training. Um, and maybe she felt she needed to do that, but also she was a Scorpio. She was, a, you know, with Mars, a uh, ruling planet, she was a re rebellious person. So she actually rebelled against this religious training that she had. Um, and so, um, I think the choices she started making during the Saturn period started to create a, this Jupiter, this huge, beautiful Jupiter in her ninth house, and the the good karma that she accumulated during that time, uh, or Jupiter period. Um, yeah. So then the tenth house we have a Swan, Sun, and Maga. So we're talking royalty here. Sun represents the king. Maga represents the throne. Um, very strong uh, royalty and. Mercury represents things like business, commerce, enterprise. It's in Purva Falguni. That, um, um, the symbol of that uh, nakshatra is a uh, hammock, swinging in a hammock, like rest, relaxation, arts, enjoyment, that sort of thing. So she was basically catering, her business was essentially catering to the luxurious life of royalty, or not even necessarily kings and queens specifically, but you know, a higher echelon, wealthy, influential people. That was her her work. Um, the eleventh house I mentioned, you have Mars or Yogi Graha aspecting here, um, and uh, the eleventh house, the Lord of that is is Mercury. So especially when she got into Mercury, that's when you know Chanel number no. five was created and took off, or took off because it was created in the Saturn, the end of Saturn, but took off in Mercury, um, and and things are really humming from her in the Mercury period. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then the Mars, again, there's a relationship here, because Mars, Jesta, well, Jesta, the Lugna Nakshatra is ruled by Mercury, so there's more mercurial influence, and then Mars is in Gemini, ruled by Mercury, and then it aspects uh, Virgo, which is ruled by Mercury, the 11th house, so, this this Mars and Mercury combination, you can see that like their their energies are woven together. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> They're woven together. How did I come up with that? Um, she probably came up with that. She's like channeling through me, probably. Um, and then the twelfth house we talked about a little bit. We have Rahu and Swati here. Rahu is um, the north node of the moon. They can indicate things that are hidden, unexpected, unusual. And there's a drive and ambition here. So, she, and, and it's in Swati. Swati is symbolized by things like um, uh, new grass blowing in the wind. So there's a fragility here. So I think she she needed at times to escape and isolate because there was this fragility. I mean, this is a lot of strong energy um, for somebody that I think had some vulnerabilities. Like again, if her Lugna was actually in the last degree of Scorpio, that's some instability there. She has Saturn on the moon, so there's some mental um, uh, trouble there. 
Um, and the Rahu can also indicate, much like Ketu, uh, things like uh, drugs and addiction. So in the 12th house, that's all about escapism um, and sex. So there was a drive, again, not just Mars representing libido in the 8th house of sex, but also, um, you know, and that's the thing is, again, she wasn't, she wasn't a, a prostitute per se, but what she did was she would, she would, um, she was seeking, she was, she was hunting, um, for wealthy men, especially to, uh, pay her bills and take care of her when she was in Saturn. And, um, who was it? Et, et, Etienne Balsam. She met him she was a cabaret singer and she met him. He was a wealthy man. And, um, I think her sister went off to potentially get married. I don't know if she ever did, but at least the man she was with told her they were going to get married and she believed it and went off that in direction. So that left her to her own devices to figure things out. So, um, and I think she may, might have gotten bumped from her cabaret job. So then what was she left to? So she met this man at an opportune time. She followed him, uh, she found out where he lived and went there and sort of just set, walked in and sort of claimed the place as her own um, and lived there for a number of years. And that's where she met uh, so many wealthy people and learned about their lifestyle. And she started uh, making hats um, and that started taking, so her first clients actually came out of that. Mm. So anyway, there, there was a drive there. Um, so again, not exactly prostitution, but mistress, well, well supported mistress. Um, yeah, that was her life. Um, that's, that's how she survived. And then, um, she moved to Switzerland in 1945 because sometimes if there are planets on the 12th house that can indicate immigration. And, uh, I don't, she, um, she was born in Rahu, so she didn't run much of it. She was only in Rahu for the first year and a half of her life. But that was an indication. She moved to Switzerland in 1945. She essentially stayed there after the war. And I think that was probably because she knew the negative feelings and stuff that happened uh, during the war that she was involved in. And she probably wanted to save her own hide. But um, she immigrated during the Venus de Shah, and the lord of the 12th house was Venus. So when Venus was active, this house was also active. So that's when she immigrated. And again, you know, besides the documentation that she was a Nazi collaborator, she was involved with, she had uh, romantic affairs with high-level officers and even things like during the the war, her business partners um, um, for the Chanel uh, Number no. 5 perfume were Jewish and they saw what was coming. So they handed off their shares to a Christian Frenchman to protect while this is all going on, and he returned that to them after the war. But during that time when they were in trouble, um, she started claiming she was of Aryan descent, and because of that, she was entitled to the whole uh, operation of Chanel Number no. 5. So essentially, she used that opportunity of the war to um, try to gain control of the whole thing. I mean, that was pretty um, uh, devious, a clever, devious. Um, I don't think that it worked but even with that I think they went to court and something like they had to pay her something and part of the agreement was they had to pay for all of her living expenses like big and small so they had to support her luxurious lifestyle so even in that way she maneuvered to make sure that she was taken care of you know, financially, and she would never, she could remain in this, you know, luxurious life and stuff like that. I mean, that's an interesting choice um, and request, I think, um, because in a way, she still was fearful, you know, and again, the, the Saturn years must have been very difficult for her. Um, and the way that she interpreted all the events of her childhood must have been very difficult for her, like this, um, you know, abandonment issues and issues with poverty and things like that. I, I don't think she ever outlived it. And despite her success, um, she probably had kind of an underdog mentality, I would think. Um, 
And so she was a fighter, but, you know, if she really believed in her own abilities, why would she need somebody to take care of her through life? I mean, maybe just it was easy and cushy or something, but if she had more maybe self-confidence, self-esteem, belief in herself, she'd be like, Sh, you know, I've got plenty of money. I can make more. <laughs> she could have she could have had a very different attitude. So I, thought, I found that interesting. That, she, that was part of her request when she went to... Um, with the um, the folks uh, that she was involved with, with the perfume Chanel number no. five that was interesting to me. Anyway, um, so yeah, so again, I didn't when I went through the chart, there weren't really any hiccups. Everything seemed to line up, line up. So I think if this isn't her chart, it's pretty close. Um, it may not be an exact birth time. I I, I grant that for sure. Uh, again, I wasn't specifically trying for that but again 1526 seemed to work and again maybe this is her lucky number five was my lucky number five because this was my fifth attempt to 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 try to get a chart for her um so um yeah so there it is uh, maybe it's all about lucky number five So uh, again, thank you for your time uh, and your interest in Vedic astrology, my work, and uh, maybe uh, just Coco Chanel herself. <laughs> um, I hope you found this interesting and useful. Um, again, I try to be uh, very uh, teaching-oriented when I go through these talks. My teaching videos are in my concepts playlist. Um, I do individual birth chart readings on Zoom, so if that's of interest, you can email heartlightastro.yahoo.com. And I have another YouTube channel on natural medicine, in, in, in including um, that includes other uh, Vedic arts such as Ayurveda and yoga, but also homeopathy and naturopathic medicine. And the name of that channel is Nature, Nature Source Care. So if more uh, Vedic arts are interesting to you, that might be interesting to you as well. But as always, um, I wish you well and wish you well as you navigate the different energy cycles of your life. And until the next one, namaste.